Amazing. Will y'all worship with us as we um, sing and praise the Lord? Um, one of my sisters texted me and asked me, was I going to be at church tonight? And I said, I wouldn't miss it. I love Wednesday night services and Sunday night services. I love being with all of y'all. And I just want to say, one of the ladies the other night, she said, it's time. We're praying that this season that we're in is about to come to a close. And we're about to leave this morning. And we're about to go into dancing. And we're going to rejoice. And great, mighty things are about to happen.
baptismal service right after church. If you are desiring to be baptized, get with Brother Brock. We're offering two ways. You can be baptized here at the church, or we can go down to Caney Hill, and we're going to do some baptisms there. So just get with Brother Brock about um, what you want to do. If you want to be baptized for the first time, or if you want to make that commitment and jump back in the water and be baptized a second time, yourself all washed clean again and start all over. That's the thing about God. He's not a God of one chance or two chances or 20 chances. He's a God of ever how many chances you need to get it right. Just don't use those chances hazardly. Yes. Work and make that effort. Um, also the uh, next month, September 16th, 17th, and 18th. That's Friday night, Saturday night, and Sunday. We will be having a three-day revival. Possibly. Who knows what the Lord will do. Sometimes those revivals would start with a week or three days, and they'd go on for months. Yes, yeah, so we're going to keep our options open for what the Lord wants to do here. Um, we have several that are sick, several that um, have needs, whether they're physical, spiritual, or whatever. Uh, we have some that are in the hospital. So let's go before the Lord and pray. Um, if you have a request today, just raise your hand. Um, the Lord knows the needs that have been uh, spoken out. So uh, we look around, grab somebody's need in your heart and pray for them. Looks like, Christy, are you hurt? Somebody reach over and touch Christy as we pray. Lord Jesus, we ask you, God, to come into this house. Lord, that we've dedicated to you. Lord, we ask you to move here and do a work. Lord, we ask you to move into each and every person that's watching the service online. Lord, move into their homes, Jesus. Move into their car, wherever they're at, Jesus, watching or listening. Lord, touch them in whatever it is that they need, Lord. Touch each of our families, Jesus. Lord, each of our members, Lord, we pray it all in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Somebody shout praise the Lord. I told Sister Ashley that uh, I've been praying. I was helping her a little bit in the shower. I was helping her pray for the way we do stuff. praying, I said, because it won't anybody else show up, I might see Christy again Sunday. And so I, I want y'all to do me a favor. If I do, don't get up and leave saying, hey, I heard it the first time and didn't like it. Don't do that. Don't do that. I was, I was speaking to one of my good friends who pastors in Jackson, Alabama. Uh, he is the uh, Alabama Children's Ministry Director, and uh, he was talking about the great service that they had in Alabaster and said Sister Playball just comes swinging and left swinging. So I, I like that. He asked me this, though. Brother Harold asked me. He said, Brother, does she ever share her notes with you? I said, Brother, her notes is in Trump's vault. The DOJC has them right now. I said, there ain't no way to get them. I said, I said, and, I said, and Sister Lisa sold me a, sold me an iPad and wiped it clean like the FBI before I got it. I said, I'm in a fix. It's just me and the Lord up here. Now, you're going to need this later. So go ahead and say it now. Oh, me, oh, my. Luke chapter 14, verse 27. love that we uh, honored Jason last night, and I, I really do, from the moment that we started to the time that we closed, I believe that we blessed Jason Burnett. I believe that we blessed him. And yesterday, a 
don't 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 question me on this. Yesterday, from the beginning in the morning to the ending of the night, was the fourth worst day of my life. And I believe, I truly believe this. I believe that if the devil comes against a church, he starts at the head and works his way down to the body. But I also know that if he's fighting this hard, he must know something that we don't know. He must know something that we don't know. Luke chapter 14, verse 27. And whosoever does not bear his cross and follow me cannot, I'm going to add emphasis here, cannot in no way be my disciple. So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. Let's pray for a moment in Jesus' name. Lord, I just praise and magnify and glorify your name tonight, God. Lord, you are a great God, and we give you praise. Lord, we know you're here. We feel your anointing. Your presence is here with us. And God, we know that your word does not go out and return void and let your word work its purpose tonight in Jesus' name. Let's give the Lord a great hand clap. Praise the Lord. You can be seated. Jesus spoke to great multitudes, and he instructed them on what it meant to truly be his disciple. And being a follower of Jesus is something like bearing a cross. Now, if you ever watch the the, the movie um, where Jesus died on the cross or not just the one, the popular one, but any one of them, you know that cross-bearing is painful, sorrowful. And so I could imagine that the listeners, when Jesus told them that you must bear your own cross, I, I imagine that they were horrified as Jesus spoke these words. Because they all knew what he meant. In the Roman world, in that day that he spoke the words that we should bear our own cross, before a man died on a cross, he had to carry his cross to the place of execution. And carrying a cross always led to death on a cross. You didn't carry a cross unless you knew that the purpose was you was going to die on this cross. And so... No one carried a cross for fun. It wasn't just fun to carry a cross. You, nobody stood around in, in living rooms or stood around churches and just, you know, made up conversation and, and spoke conversation about how fun it is to carry the cross. The first hearers of Jesus didn't need an explanation of the cross. They knew it was unrelenting. They knew it was an instrument of torture. They knew it was an instrument of death. And they also knew that it was an instrument of humiliation. So when Jesus Christ told his disciples that you can only come and follow me by carrying your cross, he was telling them that it's going to be torture to carry the cross. It's going to be death to carry the cross. And it's going to be humiliating to carry the cross. If someone took up his cross, he never came back. It was a one-way journey. Jesus made it clear that the one who bore his own cross would follow the life and pattern of Jesus Christ. Jesus made it clear that only cross-bearers can be his disciples. You can be a follower of Jesus Christ. It is possible that you can follow him but not be a disciple. Somehow we have the impression that following Jesus doesn't cost much. Somehow. Somehow we've come up with carrying the cross is nothing more than just a picture 
of Jesus Christ. And we never put ourselves under our own cross. And as he carried his cross, we never put ourselves under our cross. Carrying the cross is to crucify. It's to crucify the sinful desires and sinful pleasures of our flesh. We must carry the cross because it's the only way that sin dies in our lives. Anyone who cares about their financial responsibilities will always be concerned about the cross, the cost. You don't, you don't go out and just buy something that's beyond your financial capability because you know that there's going to come a time that you're going to lose what you're trying to purchase. So you're going to be wise. You're going to concern yourself with your financial responsibilities about how much it costs. And things are rising and the costs are rising today. And people, are, we can't help it. You still got to live. So we're still buying. Any person who is intent on making any kind of purchase, any kind of purchase. My wife told me today, she said, don't be window shopping. We ain't got time. We ain't got time. I, I, saw a, I saw a truck that I liked, and it had a price tag on it that I liked, and she just said, we ain't got time. But why are you window shopping? Because I'm concerned about the cost. I don't want to pay too much. I'm concerned about the cost. But you know what? The cost must be counted. The cost must be counted. Spirituality, being spiritual, being a spiritual person, it demands consecration. You can't be spiritual in one aspect and not be consecrated in a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. If you're going to be if you're going to be spiritual, you're going to be consecrated. You're going to dedicate yourself to him. You're going to live a lifestyle that honors him. I hit a roadblock there, but I'm on, I'm just going to ride over it. Character. Character demands principles that are founded not by your own idea, but founded by the Word of God. Me and my wife were talking about this on the way down here. How has the country gotten so bad we've took one element out of it, and instead of ruling our government by what the Word says, we're ruling our government by what the man says, and you see what kind of condition our government's in? You can't rule your lives by what you say. You've got to rule your lives by what the word of the Lord is. Character. 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 Your, your Christian character demands principles that are founded by the word of God. Even revival. We're all wanting revival. How many of you? I believe. Come on, somebody. I believe. We're wanting revival. But do you know what? Revival also demands consecration. God's just not going to flippantly pour out revival on us and we're not doing anything to obtain it. Amen. We've got to consecrate ourselves to Him. Righteousness demands us to focus on God and what He's doing and the shortcomings in our lives. You've got to count the cost. You've got to consider the price of living for the Lord Jesus Christ. You can't live so cheap that it doesn't cost you. How many of you know Michael Phelps? I believe we all do. My, Michael Phelps is the most decorated Olympian in history. I didn't know that. I thought he was only the most decorated Olympian in the field of swimming. But he's the most decorated Olympian in history. He has 28 medals. Michael Phelps has won in the Olympics, and 23 of them are gold. That's, that's, that's an awesome achievement. But it's no secret, it's no secret that Michael Phelps trained hard. You, you have to, if you want to be the greatest swimmer in the world, you've got to train hard. I would say this, if you want to be a great Christian, you've got to train hard. I, I imagine that Michael Phelps, there's many mornings that he woke up not wanting to go out and swim and train, but I imagine somewhere in his mind he, he counted the cost and he said, if I'm going to win the prize, then I've got to do the work. And during the peak of his, his, his training, uh, Lord, I, wouldn't even, I, I, I ain't even capable of walking this in a week. Michael Phelps swam 50 miles a week, 50 miles a week. He also lifted weights three times a week, and every workout was five to six hours that he lifted weights. 
He ate eight to 10,000 calories a day and had no junk food in there. Was no temptation of junk food. And a lot of his training was focused on the fundamentals. Just how do, how, how do I kick better? How do I over overfull my arms better? How do I do everything better? Just the fundamentals. And beyond the intense workouts and the crazy diet, there is a huge mental aspect to training that Phelps succeeded at. Michael Phelps was disciplined and laser-focused on his goals. I want to pause to ask us here, do we have any goals living for the Lord Jesus Christ? Are there any goals in your life that I want to achieve this goal in my relationship with him? I don't, not that I want to see him doing something, but I want to see myself. I have a goal for myself that I want to see myself doing in this relationship. Michael Phelps' work ethic, dedication, and determination combined with his natural talent set him on a path to succeed in five consecutive Olympic Games. You see, Phelps understood that to do extraordinary things, you had to go above and beyond. Look, don't get mad at the person that's sitting down and not doing anything on a Sunday morning or a Wednesday night when you're worshiping. If you're going to do anything extraordinary, you're going to have to go above and beyond everybody else. I didn't know this. I, I, I just found this out. Uh, through Google, that you can purchase an Olympic gold medal for around $750. You can go out and buy an Olympic gold medal for $750. That's a lot of money to us, but really, considering a gold medal, that's cheap. $750, original, original gold medal. Do you know what? You can place your $750 medal on a shelf with one of Michael Phelps' medals. And they both cost $750. But Michael Phelps' medal is more valuable because it come with a price. Come on, somebody. Don't judge your life by somebody else's. Don't judge your life by, don't judge your spirituality by somebody else. You be the best Christian that you could be and quit worrying about everybody else. You just do your best. You, you paid money for your medal. Michael Phelps paid a price for his. Phelps, if you could, if you, if you could, if I could get by with this, Michael Phelps bear the cross of Olympic swimming. He bared the cross. He put the time in. He put the training in. Now your medal, my medal, my seven hundred and fifty medal, fifty dollar medal. Um, instead of bearing the cross of Olympic swimming. Our $750 medal buried the cross of an Amazon delivery. Pretty cheap way out, isn't it? Don't have to exercise, don't have to swim, don't have to run, don't have to lift weights. Just pick a package up off the porch or tell your husband to go get it or whatever. I mean, it, it, don't, it don't cost much. But you know, if you sell a gold medal, if you sell a gold medal, you have to have a letter of... Uh, in, Authenticity. It shows the history. The, uh, the letter of authenticity shows the history of that metal. Shows where it was sold at, what it's been through, who has bought it, whose hands have been on it. And so your letter of authenticity states, purchased from Amazon, $750. Michael Phelps' letter of authenticity for his metal says one in the Olympics. By Michael Phelps, valued at $1 million. Come on, did you know you and I have a letter of authenticity in heaven? We have a letter of authenticity in heaven. Revelations 20 and 12 says, and I saw the dead. That's you and I. He said, I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were open, and another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead, the dead were judged out of the things which were written in the books according to their works. That letter of authenticity says it's according to their works, their value. 
But there's a book of life that your name must be in. You can't get into heaven if your name's not in the Lamb's book of life. It has to be there. But friend, let me tell you what you're going to be judged out of. You, the Bible says in Revelations 20 and 12, and the books were opened. And you're going to be judged out of those books. There are 66 books in this cover right here. And from Genesis to Revelations, there's going to come a day that you're going to stand before the Lord and the Bible, and your letter of authenticity is going to be judged out of the books that are open before you. And you, you, don't have, you don't have to have an attorney because you don't have a leg to stand on. Because if you have not obeyed the word of the Lord, your, your name is not in the Lamb's book of life. I'm not trying to be a fear monger. I'm not trying to, to push anything on you. But I want to ask you a question. What is the value? What is the value that God is placing on your cross right now? If you had to go get a letter of authenticity for the cross that you're bearing right now, how valuable would that be? What would that letter say about your authenticity, where it's been, the history behind it, who's touched it, who's been around it? How many hours of training do you have in Bible reading? It's all about your letter of authenticity. How many hours of training do you have in prayer? How many hours of training do you have in fasting? What sins have you stopped? Well, I knew we might have to bring this back Sunday. Y'all just don't walk out, though. What about modesty? What about your letter of authenticity? Do you dress in a worldly fashion to expose yourself? Or do you dress in a holy fashion to cover yourself up? Come on. God gave us all our natural hair color. He gave us our natural facial complexions. Are you satisfied with how God made you? Or are you trying to dye, paint, and cover up what God made, trying to make it better? Friend, you can't make, you can't make yourself better than what God created you. And I, I'm just going to speak for every man in the world. We know what's fake and we know what's not fake. Come on, we know what's on that cover. We know it's been photoshopped. We know it's been censored. We know it's been put out there to sell and market. Don't you line yourself up to anything that's on any kind of magazine. Because the most beautiful women in the world are, the, are women who have natural hair color. They have their natural, they, they don't put no makeup on. It's a natural beauty. You don't have to paint yourself up to try to sell yourself as somebody. That's why we don't believe in, in things like cutting your hair and dyeing your hair and putting makeup on and wearing all kind of jewelry. We're not trying to, we're not, our ladies are not trying to build themselves up to be sold. There's a, there's a price upon them greater than any ruby or any jewel that's ever been given to man. You need to be satisfied. Look, if somebody, if somebody around you is making you feel insecure about your looks, you need to pay attention and understand that God says you're a 10. He looks at you as being a 10. Oh, you're beautiful in his eyes. You don't have to fix anything. Why? He created you that way. That's the way he created you. Have you seen a baby come out of the womb with earrings? Have you seen a baby come out of the womb with a beard? Have you seen the baby come out of a womb with long, long hair for a boy baby? You hadn't seen any of that. Why? Because we're delivered in our natural state, and God wants us to stay that way. Amen. All right, I'm going to move on now. y'all. Look, Do you constantly pay your tithes, or is $2 enough? I'm not trying to be rude. I'm not trying to be harsh. I'm just, just trying to help us. If you're on our leadership team, do you have your responsibilities figured out at home or do you wait till you get to church to figure them out? Because, friend, if you're trying to figure out a lesson, a song, or a message on the way here, you're way behind the work of God. Your letter of authenticity is de-appreciating. You need to have all that figured out before you get here. 
Look, if you're a Sunday school teacher, start on Monday morning figuring out how you're going to teach this class. If you're a preacher, start on Monday morning figuring out what you're going to preach on Wednesday night and what you're going to preach on Sunday. If you're, a, if you're a praise team, come here already prepared. Everything in the computer, everything on the, everything ready to go. Don't come in here wasting time trying to figure out what am I going to do here. God is more valuable and living for Him. He deserves our best. If he considers us a 10, we need to give him a 10. And people know when we're not prepared. People know, people know when we're pulling it out of our rear end, so to speak. Don't quote me on that. Are you a follower of Jesus Christ? Or are you a disciple of Jesus Christ? 5,000 followed him. But when they were full of fish and bread, they walked away. When the miracles was over, they were gone. Only the disciples went with him. Cross-bearing demands a commitment, doesn't it? I've had the pleasure, if you want to call it that, a personally knowing an Olympic gold medalist, and uh, she lived in uh, she lived in Mountain Brook, Alabama. In her, and she lived with her parents in Mountain Brook, Alabama. Uh, we'll just say this: that her name's Jennifer, and we won't we won't go no farther. Um, at age 17, she won the Olympic gold medal for diving, and uh, she was an Olympic gold medalist. It took me and two other men to paint their house. We stayed work. We stayed working on 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 Jennifer's mother and dad's house that she lived in with her parents. She was 18 years old at the time. She was already a gold medalist. It took us three months, three men, three months to paint the inside and outside of their house. And Jennifer was touted to become one of the most decorated female athletes of her time. Everybody was raving. The, the, the newspapers was raving. Sportscasters was raving. Jennifer is the next new thing. She's going to win more female gold medals than anybody else. And when her mom, I mean, her mom talked about her all the time. So when her mom said that we was going to be able to be introduced to her and meet her, I was excited to meet her. You know, I had, I had in my picture, uh, you know, an Olympic athlete. I had a picture in my mind what an Olympic female gold medalist would look like. And to my disappointment, she was not what I pictured. She smoked cigarettes like a chimney. I mean, one right after the next, lit one off of one. You never seen her that she wasn't a little bit tipsy. And she had the most foulest, rudest mouth of any female or any man that I've ever met in my life. And she carried herself as if she had arrived when she didn't even know where she was going. A young female athlete who was touted to win many Olympic gold medals never won another one. Never won another one. She thought her talent could bear the cross of the Olympics. But talent without discipline and willingness to take up your own cross will not get you to the gold. Talent alone is not good enough. And Jennifer messed her back up on a dive and was in the hospital for three weeks simply because she refused to train. She absolutely refused to train. She loved diving but she didn't like lifting weights. She loved diving, but she didn't like swimming 50 miles a week. She loved diving, but that's all that she loved. There are conditional and unconditional promises of God. The unconditional promises of God are those that God is bound to, to, to do despite the attitude and the actions of people. There's going to be an end time revival. That's unconditional. There ain't nothing we can do about it. That's, gonna, that's going to happen. 
There will be a great end time revival. Why? You go to the word, it's in the word. You go to prayer and you sense it. It's going to be a great end time revival. But then there are conditional promises of God, such as our personal revival and our personal growth. They come to rest only on those who are willing to give, to pay, to reach, to strive, and to alter everything about their spiritual life as they reach for God. Friend, you can't, you can't have a true revival or spiritual growth without there be some kind of cross in your life that you've got to bear. There, there, there's got to be some things in your life that this cross crucifies. This cross has to crucify some of those things. 2 Chronicles 7 and 14 says, If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. You know who, you know who God's talking about right there? His people, his consecrated people, his people who have dedicated themselves to him, who have set themselves apart a in, a, in a manner of holiness and living holy lives. The Lord said, if they will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then will he hear. You know how to fix the world, and you know how to fix the, the, the family members and the friends that you got that's just all gone haywire right now? You don't try to work on them. You try to work on yourself. If the church would humble themselves and pray and turn from their Pentecostal traditions and their wickedness, I, I truly believe that we would, that God would forgive our sin and that he would heal our land. Because I, I believe the church as a body, we need to pick up a cross and begin to carry a cross of sacrifice. Sacrificing our will for God's will. How much will it cost for God to begin building in your life? How, how long does God have to strive with you to get you into a place to where you finally say, okay, God, not my will, but your will be done. I'm ready to bear my cross. Some of you are going through stuff right now, and I hope there's some folks listening to me online. There, there's some of you going through some stuff right now, and the reason you're going through it is because you simply refuse to take up your cross. You refuse to take up your cross and you're, you refuse to relinquish your will and you're living in your will alone and it's costing you. But if you live in God's will, there's going to be a cross to bear. Some say. My sisters or my little brother would say Jeannie Brock. Some say. I was spoiled as a child, some say. When I was 13 years old, on Saturday mornings at 4 o'clock, my oldest sister, Joanne, picked me up and took me right up from the UAB hospital at a place called Hogan's Hideaway Restaurant and Lounge, and I, I vacuumed for about three hours, and then they opened the restaurant up for breakfast, and I busted tables and washed dishes the rest of the day. And it wasn't long before I was uh, leaving in the evenings after I'd worked there until I was about 15 to 16 years old. It wasn't long I was leaving in the evenings and walking, uh, leaving at late at night, walking eight blocks down into downtown Birmingham, 9 and 10 o'clock at night to catch the very last bus while I'm number five back home. I was scared to death those late nights. I mean, I, I, I've come across them as a 14, 15, 16-year-old kid downtown Birmingham at 10 o'clock. I've come across some characters. But you know what I was worried about the most? I can't miss that bus. I can't miss that bus. While others were out playing on a Saturday morning when my friends were sleeping in, when everybody said, hey, he's a spoiled little child, I was paying a price. I was paying a price. Yes, I had the best bicycle in town. Yes, I had the nice clothes. Yes, I was a spoiled child, but I paid a price for all of those things. And friend, I want to tell you right now, don't think for one moment that God's just going to pour out blessings on you and you're not paying a price to receive them. There's got to be a cross in your life to bear. 
You're going to have to bear a cross. Now that I'm older, my priorities have changed. I never will forget the... the let me ramble for a moment. Is that all right? I never will forget. I, I, I was about 15 years old. And I, like, I worked a Saturday, all day Saturday, from 4 o'clock in the morning to about 3 o'clock that evening. They paid me $20. I was happy, man. Back then, you know, $20 to buy two, two gallons of milk, not just one. I told my sister, I said, I, I've been saving up for this, Joanne. I said, I, I want to go up the hill. And there was a professional barber shop up there where they did businessmen's cuts. Now that's just called a regular cut. <laughs> but you, they did a businessman's cut, and it cost $20. And I'd worked all day to go get my hair cut at a business. I, and I, I walked out of there feeling like I somebody got me a professional haircut. Probably their first day on the job. <laughs> but I got a professional haircut. I went back down to Hogan's Hideaway, and my sister looked at me, and she said, don't even look like you got a haircut. And, and the two ladies that worked in the kitchen with me was having to, having to defend me, tell her, leave him alone, leave him alone. He's worked all day for that haircut, and look at you, want to talk to him like that. Can I tell you, I want to be spoiled but I'm not. And this is the sense that I want to be spoiled in. I want God to spoil me. I want him to spoil me. I, I want the blessings of God poured out in my life. But you know what? I can't walk around, drink beer, smoke cigarettes, cuss, lie, cheat, steal, and walk under the blessings of God and say, hey, I'm blessed. God, God's just spoiling me. He's not going to do it. He's only going to bless those who are wearing a cross you got to have a cross in your life. There's got to be some, that, that cross that you bear brings sin out of your life. It brings the attitude out of your life. It somehow softens your heart and lets you see things more differently. I don't want to go here, but I, I, I will. I mean, the Lord's got me in the moment, so I might as well just defame myself even more. I told this story last night to Daniel Burnham. I said, I, I, I said, I said, Brother Burnham, y'all got any people in y'all's church that, you know, you just have to deal with all the time? And he said, um, no. <laughs> I said, well, it's different here then, I guess. I told him, I said, because he was bragging, he, you know, he, they got a, all this, this whole church got on fire over Sister Casey this weekend. I'm glad about that. He was, he was bragging on Sister Casey, and, and uh, I just felt like I wanted to tell my most famous story about Sister Casey to him. And um, I said, hey, y'all don't have nobody, y'all don't have nobody like that? He said, no, we don't have nobody like that. I said, well, you know, one time I said something very flippant that I should not have said because somebody just aggravated me to the high heavens. The high heavens. And the next day I got a phone call. And Sister Casey said, hey, Brother Brock, how you doing? Good morning. God bless you. Great day, ain't it? Beautiful day. Yeah. Beautiful day, Sister. How you doing? She said, hey, uh, you know so-and-so. I'm talking about the one I kind of chewed out a little bit yesterday. Said, you know her? Yeah, 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 I know, I know. Um, so you know him? Yeah, I know him. I know him. Well, Brother Brock, do me a favor. Uh, can you describe what their home life's like? Huh? Describe their home life? No, I can't describe their home life. She said, well, look, uh, the, 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 the person they're in the house with, uh, are they being abused? Or, or, or are there groceries in the home? Or is, is the bills behind? I mean, you know, you know them. Tell me about them. No, I don't know none of that. So you really don't know them? No, no, no. Not that they could buy I guess I do. Sister Kay said, well, you know what? God knows them. She said, and, and, and God treats them. God treats them like he loves them because he knows them. God treats them. He said, and, and Sister Kay said, you know what? If you're going to be the pastor, maybe you need to treat them like God treats them. Brother Daniel told me, he said, you get off the phone and go pray. I said, no, sir. I had to go get to adjust myself. <laughs> I 
But are you like me? Does your character sometimes get corrupt because you throw the cross off? Are there times in your life when you just decide that I'm not going to wear this, I'm just going to give somebody a piece of my mind? I told somebody one time, you better watch out, there ain't much left in the sack. You gave a lot away. Don't give no more away. You might, you might look at there one day and they'll all be gone. <laughs> Don't do that. But there are times in our life when cross-bearing is not a priority. But it should be. It should be all the time. Used to, my priority was getting a business cut. And y'all going to roll me under the bus for this one. There was a Woolworths right up the street. And some Saturdays I'd get my $20 and I'd go up there and I'd buy me a G.I. Joe. I knew y'all would love that. Now, my G.I. Joes wasn't sissy. They were fighting men. <laughs> they, were, they were fighting men. But now that I'm older and I've got a cross on my back, my priorities have changed. And now instead of a business cut and some G.I. Joes, my priority now is to develop a dynamic prayer life. That's a priority of mine, really. Uh, having a mastery, not just knowing the Word of God, but having a mastery of the Word of God, that's a priority in my life. And impacting lives for the cause of God's kingdom, that's a priority in my life now. And striving for, to have a better character and have a better conduct, that's become a priority to me. And reaching with everything that's within me to have a revival, not only in my life, but in this church, is a priority. And having a hunger for the holiness of God, it's a priority to me. And, and, and honoring God in every area of my life is a priority. Why? Because somehow when you have a cross on your back, your priorities change. You see things differently. You see people differently. When you're carrying a cross, everything changes by the weight of the cross. Jesus said, I've got to go to Calvary. I can't miss it. Where we're trying to miss going to our Calvary. All of these things are more important to me than silver and gold. Would you like to have a brand new truck? Yes. Love to. Give me one. But you know what? Fulfilling my priority is more important. I'd rather walk than to miss out with God. If I've listed these, listen to me, if I've listed these seven things as a priority, then in, in my spirit, in my spirit, a, a young man, and I'm not, I'm not lifting myself up, but I don't know any 13 or 14 or 15-year-olds that's walking eight blocks in, at 10 o'clock at night in Birmingham, Alabama to go to a job where you make 20 and 25 and $30 a day. But it, I, it, it, it taught me something that you don't get anything for free and the blessings of God are not coming without a dedication and a hunger and a cross. All right, so since I'm, since I'm going to preach this again Sunday, maybe. I mean, how many of y'all... How many of you really feel like we all need this? Yes. Look, I forgot about my cross. Come on, somebody. I forgot about my cross. I forgot that I was supposed to be bearing a cross. I started operating in the flesh just like you. You know what? When you begin to operate the flesh and you lay the cross down, all of a sudden things begin to creep in that you never thought would creep in. Son, pick that cross back up. Put your cross back on your shoulder. How many, how many of you are like me? If I make a mistake, you don't have to come sit me at a table and tell me everything that I've done that's wrong because I've done beat myself up way more than you could ever try to beat my. Come on, you, you like that? Yes, I've done beat myself up all about that. But you know what? Jesus said, pick your cross back up. 
Come on, there's some people here. There's some people online. There's some people that should have been here. Need to pick a cross back up and say, God, I want to honor you, Lord, more than anything. I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but I do believe that our government is trying to take every right away from us, even the right to worship the Lord our God in an assembly in the house of the Lord. I believe they're, I, I honestly, I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I believe they're trying to take that right away. So there's coming a day that, there, that you need to know that a cross is on my back and I'm going to stand with bearing this cross no matter what comes my way. This ain't something, this ain't, cross bearing is not fun. Cross bearing is not anything you stand around and talk about and make jokes about. Cross bearing is when you hear something come across the pulpit or something in a private Bible study. You don't just hear it. You take it home and say, Lord, I know you're speaking to me, God. You're using my pastor to speak to me. You're using my Sunday school. You're using my music manager to speak to me, God. Lord, let me take this home and put it in my life, God. Would you stand with me? I think that we fail sometime in our efforts for truly living for God because we're out of place with God. I think we want the blessings, but we've forgotten the cross. I've been praying for this church. I've been, I've been so uh, perplexed. I've called out to the Lord, Lord, we got to have the Bible. What do, what do I need to do? I pray. I pray in the next few hours that you don't let this night pass. Or at least the next few days. That you schedule some alone time with God. And just simply consider the cost. The Bible says that no one rushes to build a tower that doesn't first sit down and consider the cost. Friend, if you're going to die with this gospel in your heart, if you're going to die filled with the Holy Ghost, you need to take a moment to consider the cause. Because you can't come in here and live one way and then go out there and live every devilish way you can think of. Revealing yourself to everybody, just trying to get a bite, just wanting somebody just to look at you, wanting somebody just to ask you. You can't live like that. You can't live with your price, with your life on sale. You've got to live sold out to the Lord. <laughs> Carrying the cross will change you. It'll change everything about you. Carrying the cross will change what you think about. Carrying the cross will change what you worry about. Carrying the cross will change how you're living in front of the Lord. I want, you, I want everybody in this church to know you're not an island by yourself. You're not alone in some room by yourself. You're not alone in a closet 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. The eyes of the Lord is on the cross bearer. So take up your cross. Take up your cross. Oh, God, we're going through a season. I told Caleb yesterday, I said, I can't wait. I said, me and my wife was talking about this 
couple of days ago, I can't wait till Silas is born. I don't care what hour of the night it is, call me. I want to be there. Our first church baby. You know why? I'm tired of hardship. I'm tired of worry. I'm tired of concern. I'm tired of having to walk on eggshells or how you're around somebody. You got to say the right thing or you're going to offend somebody. Friend, if a word offends you, you ain't carrying a cross. If your pastor trying to correct you and set you in some kind of another lane of your life and you get offended by that and walk away from God, you never had a cross to begin with. You've got to have a cross. A cross has to be in your life. You've got to have a cross in your life. You've got to crucify everything about you and say, God, not my will, but yours be done. Lord, anything in my life that's unpleasing to you, God, Lord, let this cross, let this cross get it out. I come up with this. Well, Silas, I told Caleb, I said, Silas is going to bring new life. So I asked him, I said, when's his birth, when is his birth date due? And he said, it's, it's October 17th. And I said, man, yeah, I said, that's going to bring new life. And Caleb said, we can't wait. We can't wait to October. Come on, somebody. We can't wait to October. Tonight. <laughs> Tonight. <laughs> It's got to start tonight. It's got to turn around tonight. Somebody's got to pick up your cross and say, God, you see me under the load. You see me under the load of your kingdom, under the load of your way. God, I pray that you strengthen me and encourage me. God, carry me. Give me strength, God. Lord, give me confidence. believe that they fired me. You know, I thought I couldn't be fired. How about you? I couldn't believe they fired me. December the 9th, my birthday. They called me into the office and sit me in front of the in front of the chair there in front of the desk there and said you're fired. I said, well, now hold on, don't think bad about me. I said, well, why, why are you firing me? They said, well, we're firing you because you were supposed to come to work the other day and you just didn't come. And they could have added that you talked too much. Y'all add that all the time. Man. They could have added that. They could have said you talked too much. I was working at the Alabama thrift store. Had the old yellow smock on. Looked like some kind of cone in the road. I mean, I, mean, I thought that J.C. Penney's trying to sell ladies' suits off the rack. You know, I was having a good time. Ladies were getting me to try on stuff for their husband. I was having a good time. I had the cameras all over the place. They said, we can't have that. They let them shop. I said, man, they, we got to sell them something. We got to sell them something fired me fired me I pray that when I get to the gates of heaven God doesn't say you know I've been I've been watching you you're, you're fired you can't come in here we don't, we don't allow that in here we take up our cross crucify crucify everything they told me at the thrift store this is what they told me I thought it was a long time ago they told me they said you just don't take your job seriously Friend, I don't want to be guilty 
in my walk with the Lord. So somebody saying, you know, he just don't take his character seriously. He just don't take his conduct seriously. He just don't take his cross seriously. He just don't take his walk with God seriously. I close with just this one, one line. We can all, we can all raise the value of our letter of authenticity if we're considered a cross. Now, I'm just being me, you know. Roll me, run me, whatever. I'm just being me. I had to learn. I had to learn as not a pastor, but as leadership. I had to learn that Sunday service and Wednesday night service was nothing about me. I had a role to play, but it was not about me. I had to learn that the service in a leadership role in, in this church, it, it only had one purpose, was to make a connection with the person in the pew and let them feel the Lord Jesus Christ because I was there in their presence. Come on, somebody. I've got to, I've got to have a cross so that I can be a conduit into this world into this service, every service, every service, somebody comes in here needing a Holy Ghost, and it's up to us to raise the standard of our level of authenticity to make sure that they receive what they're getting, and we just can't be flipping and, and just sitting in an office maybe uh, trying to come up with something to preach or driving in a car saying, honey, you drive, let me look here, scrolling on a, a tablet. We've got to be we got to be 100% in tune, focus. Have a laser focus that I'm a conduit. I've got to have a cross on my back. I'm a conduit to connect somebody to the Lord. It might just be your song. It might just be your testimony. It might be your lesson. It might be your preaching. It might be something that connects somebody to the Lord and they receive the Holy Ghost and their life is changed. I've got to have a cross. I can't be selfish with it. I've got to have a cross. Jesus. I just want to come pray with you. Can we all just find a place and just pray for a few moments? Take up your cross and follow Jesus. Take up your
tell our, our young men and our young ladies, don't be ashamed of who you are. You're a child. You're not a child of the world. You're a child of God. represent him well now, I, I've been in situations before Brother Cox and I, I said well let's just move past this night or let's move past this service I want to close by saying let's take this with us let's don't move past it let this be our standard let this be our standard I'm a cross bearer I'm a cross bearer. Oh, God, let's all pray in Jesus' name. Lord, I just thank you. I praise your name, God. Lord, we feel your presence here tonight in a greater way than we felt your presence. And it's, it's not anything that you have done, God. You're always the same. You never change. God, it's just that we're changing. God, when we change, Lord, we feel your presence in a different way, more powerful, God, more real to us. Lord, I just praise you for the continued work that you're doing in this church. God, I am so proud. God, I, I can't tell this church enough how proud I am of them. I just ask that you use them in a greater capacity. In Jesus' name.